My skin, look at my skin. <laughs> look at it. I mean, it looks better on right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, you can see my finger. <laughs> wow. Well, well, freak Lauren out. She thinks you're alone the entire time. I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> She's not here yet. I know. Joking. Just go lurk in the background over there. Oh my god. I will. But my skin looks great on Zoom, it is does. my point. <laughs> that was the whole point. I thought getting my hair cut meant I would stop playing with my hair, and I just, I think it's worse, honestly. Because it feels better to touch. Yeah, because I'm like... Mm. Mm. You look more aerodynamic. <laughs> Thank That's you. That's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just because the, on the side is like a swoop. Mm, yeah. Uh, I imagine, for some reason, I imagine myself being thrown from a catapult. <laughs> that was the first thing <laughs> that I thought of. Not just like running or biking or yeah um, anything you know. else that's more <laughs> logical <laughs> oh my gosh okay oh hey will you um go to our facebook page in a few minutes and tell me if it's showing up okay Keep it muted though, because that sound is very jarring. There we go. Okay. Hello. Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna um, start the stream now. Okay. Share a page. Okay, it's preparing. Okay. There we go. There's like a cartoon bar that's going. Um, wow. All right, it looks like we are we are good to go. Um, hi everybody. Uh my name's Kiwi. I work for Sidewalk. I'm our education outreach coordinator, interim marketing coordinator very person who does various things um and i'm so excited to be here um i am going to start out with a couple of announcements at the beginning just you know to make it feel like a real salon um tomorrow is the last day to register for book and film club for july um we are reading about christopher nolan so if you're bummed that tenant is not coming out this month r.i.p uh you can get your nolan fix um through that so we have books that we'll mail to you um, we'll watch the films on our own time. Uh, you know, uh, the film is Memento, 
this month and then we'll kind of convene at the end of the month to talk about the book and the film and probably some other Nolan films. Um, Corey, our, one of our programmers, is going to be facilitating that discussion um, and Alabama State Council on the Arts provides some funding for that, so big thanks to them. Um, and we have some t-shirts available for sale on our website. There are some older designs and we just launched a new shirt yesterday that's a reprint of an old design in a new colorway. So um, those are really helping support us while we're closed. So if you guys need to update your work from home wardrobe, we got you. Um, I'm definitely sick of all of my clothes that I've been lounging in. So and we have stuff starting at $5. So go, go get you some, some merch. Um, and we have tons of online stuff coming up. We've got some online workshops next week with Daniel Scheinert, um, Rachel Ramist, and Leah Gallant. So um, all of that information can be found on our website. Um, and I feel like I feel like that's three announcements is like the, the threshold of announcements where I start to lose interest. I'm going to stop talking now. Um, but I want to go ahead and welcome Lauren. Um, she is going to be talking about the art of the documentary. And Lauren, I'm going to let you introduce yourself because I feel like I'm pretty yeah. bad people so Great. yeah so so I'm Lauren I am uh, currently a Birmingham resident although right now I'm at my parents house in Texas in my childhood room um I and I work ambiance. yeah no it's green so it's fun yes. uh <laughs> I um I work for Red Clay Media uh underneath Alabama Media Group right in downtown and I mostly make documentaries about people in the South and in Alabama, like short docs for uh, social media. And I also make some nature docs for them. And I also do independent films, uh, narrative and music videos outside of that. So kind of still have my hands in everything, not uh, one specific thing. Um, like some people, I like to do all of it. I, you know, shoot, produce, direct, edit, all the various things depending on the project. Um, but today I'm talking about documentaries specifically. So we'll get to that. Is that a good enough intro? <laughs> yeah, yes. 10 out of 10. Stuck awesome. the landing. Cool. So should I just get into it? Yeah, go for it. Alrighty. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And if you guys have questions at any point during this, if you want to add them during in the comments, I'll kind of keep an eye on those and we'll we'll try to answer those as best we can. Or and by we I mean probably Lauren, because y'all probably don't want to ask me anything. Maybe. Maybe. Um, cool. So this is um, first slide, the art of the documentary. So what I'm gonna get into here is my sort of my take on the potential for documentary. I know there's kind of been a big wave of interest in documentary films uh, over the past year, the past decade, uh, maybe more so than previously. And uh, a lot more people are getting into filmmaking. And the things I'm going to talk about can apply to, you know, feature docs, if you're making those, all the way down to just making like a short commercial piece for a local business. Um, kind of taking concepts and ideas from the narrative world and even the music video world and stuff like that and incorporating them into documentaries to make them more artful, more emotional, um, and in my opinion, just more interesting. Um, it's still, still allowing you to say your point and get your facts out there, but just some, uh, some of my perspective on what I like to bring to my documentaries. Um, so, you know, that it's an art form. It's not just uh, reality. It's your perspective on reality or the filmmaker's perspective on that reality. So it's a collaboration between the subject, the artist, and the audience. And it's not just this black and white statement. So to start off, I have some quotes that I found uh, that are related to what I'm going to talk about that some people like quotes. Um, so this first one is kind of what I just said. News makes things black and white. Documentary filmmaking should do the opposite. And this is by an American writer, Robert Greene. And I think this is very true. Uh, with documentaries, you kind of want to show the world that gray area and let the audience take what they want to from it, not just put facts in their face um, and that be it. Uh, I, I think that's a different form of documentary that exists for sure, that's totally valuable. Um, but what we're talking about today is more so the 
artful, um, creative kind of documentary filmmaking. Second quote is a little longer. Uh, it's by a Scottish documentary, documentarian, John Grierson, and I'll read it. In documentary, we deal with the actual and in one sense with the real, but the really real, if I may use that phrase, is something deeper than that. The only reality which counts in the end is the interpretation, which is profound. And I really like this quote because it talks about how really what you gain from a film is that sort of all around experience and takeaway and feeling and emotion and what you're going to carry with you might not be, you know, the, the cut and dry facts and story. It might be a specific image that really resonated. It might be a character or uh, some other aspect of the story that only is brought about through that sort of artful collaboration that I was talking about. So uh, I have a couple of different subjects uh, I'm gonna get into or topics, kind of just the pre-production, production, post-production production, post and, and how what I'm talking about can relate to those. So we have the subject, the outline, and then utilizing cinematic language. I'll briefly talk about hybrid films, um, the interview, if your documentary includes interviewing, and the edit. So first off is the subject. Who or what is your subject? And it's all about telling a story. So when you're making a documentary, in my opinion, even if say your documentary is, okay, it's about this person or it's about this event, uh, rather than just going through and saying, okay, I'm gonna cover everything I can about this person or everything I can about this event, uh, it's really helpful to think about an idea or maybe a takeaway you want your audience to have and focus your decisions into that realm. So I'll use an example here. This photo is of uh, Dr. Frances Carter and she's a Birmingham resident and she founded the American Rosie the Riveter Association. So she works with all sorts of women that worked uh, during World War II and she herself was an actual Riveter. Although to be considered a Rosie, you don't have to have been an actual Riveter, just been a working woman during the war. Um, so our task was to make, make a documentary about her and you know, there's a lot of different ways that this one could have gone and we decided to incorporate some of the larger elements and some of the facts of the Rosie the Riveters and what they were and what the association is now, as well as her personal story. But in that, the main message we were trying to get across was that women are powerful and capable and, uh, also the historical context that a lot of these women helped set the stage and open the door for women now to go out and do things that they might not have been able to do before. So sort of that female empowerment narrative uh, using her story and the Rose of the Riveter story behind it. Um, so my other point here is deciding the focus and meaning of your film early on will help drive all other choices, even if it changes because documentaries are only truly written in the edit. And we'll get to that a little bit more later. But uh, so say we had this idea with her, uh, we knew exactly what we wanted to get. At every stage of the documentary, that subject is gonna shift and change. And depending on what interview you get, what you're able to capture on camera, uh, how things look in the edit and all of that play a part in what your final message or your final subject is really going to be. Um, so there's been other projects I've worked on where our idea of what our subject was in the beginning was very different from what it was in the end. Uh, but you know, that's what it was meant to be and I'm happy with how it turned out. Um, so for uh, the next one, we've got the outline. So then once you find your subject and you know what you wanna talk about, I like to put it together into an outline and everybody has different ways of doing this. And also depending on your project, there's gonna be uh, lots of different ways you can go about this. I love a good audio video outline. Um, I typically put video on the left, audio on the right. And this helps me sort of 
it's sort of the storyboard for the documentary uh, because you, there's so many variables that you might not have enough control to be able to actually draw out an image for each thing like you would in a narrative. Um, but there's still ways to be really creative in this outline and uh, flesh out all of the possible ideas and, and images that you might be able to use for it. So here's an example on this page of, uh, from My Friend the Goose, which screened at Sidewalk last year. Um, and you can see that I've got different color coding stuff going on with, you know, the red is his voice talking what I, this was before the interview even. So this is what I am hoping to get out of the interview from him. So just sort of like general notes, some, some specific phrases. Uh, the yellow highlighted stuff is notes um, about, you know, locations and other things that are sometimes really helpful to have in this sort of master outline. Um, I think in all forms of filmmaking, it's really good to have that balance of, you know, left and right brain, like logistical, what makes sense to do, and then the creative, exploring all these different things. So the outline, although it can feel like it's not that fun, uh, is actually allows you to be more creative in the future because you did all the hard work to make sure it all made sense and flow together. Um, but again, like I said, outlines can change, edits can change uh, in a documentary. And I just like to go into it with as much preparation as I possibly can. So that way when it shifts, I know I kind of can picture exactly how that piece might adjust in the overall picture instead of uh, it's sort of being a, a crazy kind of, uh, we don't know what we're doing and we're figuring it out as we go, which you know sometimes works. And depending on your uh, situation, you might have to go into something completely unprepared to capture the right thing. But it's always good to know what that piece is meant for and where that's gonna fit in in the future. And that could even inform, even if it's a run and gun situation, that might inform what kind of lens you use, that might inform what kind of stabilization you're using if you already have an idea of where that moment is going in the story. So this is sort of like the pre-script, I would call the edit the final script. <laughs> um, and actually in the first example I mentioned, the Rosie the Riveter one, she, you know, she was a 97 year old woman, she, she's 98 now I think. Uh, and so we did her interview and I actually cut together the audio from her interview uh, and then put that into the audio side of the outline. So it was actually the real script, the outline. Um, and then I was like, okay, what kind of video do we need for this? So also in documentary, there's a lot of different ways you can adjust uh, what stage you're doing when, and that can help make the final product what it is. Like you might want to have your music before you even get into the edit. Whereas, you know, narrative stuff, a lot of the time they score it after. Or like I said, you might want to do your interview and edit your interview before you even go in to get B-roll kind of thing. Um, so I've got a couple other outline examples here. Uh, this one on the left, I actually pulled images from Man of Steel. Uh, for a documentary about a janitor where we were uh, getting creative and having him be visually represented as a superhero for the kids uh, at the school. And so this was helpful in that outline, but uh, this was one of the few times I actually put images in the outline, but it helped because it was a really collaborative project. So it helped for me and for the, my partner to be on the same page. Uh, another Another awesome thing that you can do in documentary world as well is make a lookbook. Uh, I've been doing a lot more of those lately and that's just sort of like pulling any image that speaks to you about the story or from a film you might want and just put them all, put them all in one PowerPoint together. Uh, and that can be a really helpful way to share what your vision is as well. But the outline, like I said, is a little more uh, cut and dry than some of the other stuff. So this one on the right here, um, you can see again, I have his audio on the right. This was for um, a video called One in a Million about a guy that counted to one million in his apartment one summer on a live stream. And the live stream was like pretty much on the whole time. It's a crazy story. Um, so I have color coding here too, where this one is uh, 
locations or maybe days of shooting that I've kind of been able to divide out with the outline. So having the outline helps me plan the days and the shoots. And so like the blue one is completely different uh, setting. The, you know, the orange is his interview shot. And then the red was uh, this scene that we set in a theater for his. Um, I've also used color coding to just divide different phases of the story, like, um, you know, with regular beat sheet kind of thing, you know, the, the intro, the, the building thing, the, the conflict, the climax, the resolution, that kind of thing. I'll use that to color code my outlines too. So they can get really colorful. Um, and just depending on who you're working with and what you need to, to get on paper before you go and film, uh, it's a really, really great tool for that. Um, okay, yeah, next one. So next, uh, in, in doing your outline and in all of your thinking, utilizing cinematic language can be really valuable. Um, as I said, if it's a run and gun situation, you might just have to kind of get what you can get. But I would say to keep in mind all of the different meanings and impacts that every single choice you make can have. Now there's a little more leeway with documentaries because it's understood that you don't have as much control as you might in a narrative. Um, and sometimes it's just more important to, to get the, the action going on than it is to craft the exact perfect shot, you know. Uh, but what I like to do is really think about this. And if you have the outline uh, that you've already written out of kind of what story you wanna tell, and maybe even what shots or what scenes you wanna have, then you can go into more of a, a shot list idea and like, well, this moment uh, is gonna go on top of them talking about when they were really prideful and came out of this hard time. And so we wanna have these low angles that uh, emphasize the subject to make them seem really powerful. Or we wanna have a slow tracking shot to show how far they've come. Uh, and things like that. I know this sounds like I might be talking more about, uh, you know, a story, but, uh, or like a, a narrative, but uh, documentaries can very much be that. It just takes a little bit of work on the front end to come up with that structure. Uh, let's see, what else? So angle, type of shot, depth of field, movement, color, and even scripts are not just reserved for the structured narrative world. So I have two examples here, actually, that I'll talk about too. Uh, We've got Marlene, Queen Marlene on the left here. Uh, her video, she's a, well, she was a Walmart greeter before they stopped having Walmart greeter. She still works at Walmart, um, but she wore a tiara. She wore a tiara every day to work. And it started out as a joke and then everyone loved it and it just became her thing. She has like dozens of tiaras. Um, so we uh, actually dressed her up and made it a little more dramatic with a crown and a, and a gown and everything. Uh, to really show uh, visually kind of what everyone else was just seeing even in her uniform. And in that one, we scripted the intro uh, in collaboration with her, kind of came up with three lines that she was going to say that would go over the intro. So that's where I'm talking about scripting, uh, to not be afraid of that in documentaries, especially if you're working with the subject and they, and they understand what your vision is and where that's going to go into the story. Uh, not everyone's going to be open to it, but in my experience, most people are pretty comfortable with it, um, especially because it doesn't put them on the spot to come up with the perfect phrasing in the moment uh, and allows them to craft exactly what they want to say. And so in that sense, uh, it, it leans a little more narrative in terms of workflow when you edit it too, because you kind of know exactly where those words are going whereas the rest of it's kind of more chaotic. Um, and then the one on the right, uh, this is a picture of the janitor that I was talking about earlier, where we dressed him up as a superhero, kind of made his, his own outfit called the Incredible Mr. E, and uh, did a lot of shots that we pulled from, like Man of Steel and other superhero films that we really liked and filmed them in his school with him. Uh, so that kind of leads me to talking about hybrid films where uh, hybrid films, I, I think it's a pretty loose term. Um, hybrid can mean a blending of two genres and it's all still a narrative. Or uh, more recently, I think it, it means 
that it's a narrative and a documentary in one, uh, which is really fun. I think I, I am super excited about hybrid films and what else is going to be coming out in the future. Uh, I don't know that I would necessarily call either of these straight up hybrid films, but uh, in terms of like we pulled from superhero movies to decide what we were going to film for The Incredible Mr. E uh, in this documentary. Uh, so maybe it's like a superhero film meets, uh, you know, a, a documentary or, or, or meets uh, uh, so, some other some other genre. Uh, I think that, and, and like with Marlene, we had the the scripting in the narr in the documentary, the narrative scripting in the documentary. Uh, I think that somewhat constitutes as hybrid, and I think it's uh, a really fun way to explore new ideas with a documentary. If you think about someone's story or think about the story you're trying to tell, and maybe like, what genre would this be if it was a narrative? Uh, you could maybe find one or more genres that then you can pull. Uh, cinematic language from to help tell your documentary. Uh, I don't know, which could be a variety of of genres, maybe, uh, well, I guess Marlene's maybe was like a princess tale or something, um, or you could pull, you know, like the superhero thing or even like horror films, depending on, you know, what kind of story you're trying to tell. Um, and I think that that can just really help um, make your film a lot more colorful and engaging to your audience. All right. Next, nope, next, there we go. Okay, so here's another example of using cinematic storytelling, uh, cinematic language in the story. So this is from my friend, The Goose. And for those of y'all that don't know, it's a story about a man that befriended a local goose at the Duck Pond down in Fairhope, Alabama. Uh, and they were really good friends for eight years, eight plus years. And he talks about how when he's out there swimming with Lucas or just being with him, that he really grounds him. And it's sort of therapeutic in a way. And so uh, we crafted his whole story around showing them together and then showing his world without him and kind of that daily grind that we all go through. And then this moment pictured here is when we come back to the pond for the end. And so this first shot here, the first two pictures are one shot and it was a handheld shaky moment that went from uh, out of focus to in focus. And so that was uh, a choice to show that, okay, he is uh, unsettled at this point. His, you know, things are coming into focus for him. And then immediately after you see the shot at the bottom here where he is laying on in the water on the ground with Lucas the goose. Uh, to, and that one was on a tripod. So those choices uh, were informed by what we knew, how we knew the story was going to go, what sort of meaning we were going to do. I mean, this could have just been, you know, a regular shot of him swimming with Lucas, but uh, we decided to think about if we were telling this story in a narrative context, you know, what, how might we show this moment visually and, and utilize those decisions and, uh, the different stabilizer options and things like that to help tell that. And my next example is uh, this one I would actually probably lean more towards calling it a hybrid film. Uh, this one's called Feed the Need and it was a, about a woman and her husband but mostly on her uh, in Bruton, Alabama and they have a donations only restaurant which is pretty uh, remarkable and they're they're fully operational. They feed uh, so many people in their community every day and it's donations only. There's no menu, there's no prices or anything like that. The community all just comes together uh, and shares in this really, really beautiful, special place. And she uh, was a wonderful lady. She uh, had all these stories. She actually wrote a memoir about different experiences she had growing up that led her to, to 
have so much attention in her life on giving back and helping others and why she is the way she is. And I heard those stories and the way that she told them was so visual anyways. I was like, I just see this happening in my head like a movie. And so we decided to take her audio telling the story and have it underneath a pretty like narrative structure um, of an edit and of a film or the, the part of the film. So you can see here, this is a full blown shot list. I, I don't, didn't have this for any of my other documentaries. Um, we really treated these scenes like they were narrative films and we had her script. I edited her interview down so we knew what the words were and what each moment was gonna be in each shot and the, those sets ran like a narrative film, uh, even though they were in a documentary. Uh, so you can see uh, this, this scene, just so y'all have context in what you're seeing. This scene is about the first time that she really, um, so the first story was her um, being given something, being given uh, a sandwich by one of her classmates in second grade. Uh, and sort of the feeling she felt, the gratitude she felt from that. And then this story was sort of the first time that she was on the, the giving end. And it's this woman in her neighborhood uh, that she, she was always uh, running around, taking care of her grandkids. Uh, and she was taught to respect your elders and help them. So she asked her one day if she needed help with anything. Uh, and she was like, yeah, actually, I need to flip this mattress and kind of clean out from under it. And then she pillaged through her purse and tried to give uh, Lisa, the, the subject, four pennies, which this was back in the, the 50s. So four pennies was worth a lot more than it is now. I mean, she could buy like a whole uh, like candy bar with it. Um, but she decided to not accept the payment and, uh, and let her keep it. And, and, and that meant more to her. And so we uh, crafted this scene and uh all the shots in it to really tell that story and and when you watch it in the end it, it is an it's not quite a narrative because they're not the ones talking we have the audio of the subject in the interview even saying a couple lines she, you know she said something like oh i said this and then she said that and so we still had her audio under it with uh with the video of the actors on top of it. And so this is more so like if any of y'all know Drunk History, they do a lot of stuff like this where they have someone telling the story and then they totally reenact it on top of it. Uh, it's kind of from that world, but, and you really have to have uh, a good subject and, and a good story to be able to achieve something like this, but it's definitely possible. And uh, I think it really, helped bring the audience into her world a lot more than you know her just telling the story would have because people are used to watching narratives people are used to watching characters you know in a setting and believing it happening and that's a way to bring them in so all of this to say uh another note that emotion is very very important in all filmmaking and it's sort of that that middle tie between like the facts we need to say, the story we need to tell, the plot points we have to get to. It's that emotion that you're really trying to get. And we felt that uh, in this instance, this was the best way to do it. So next I'll talk a little bit about uh, the interview. A lot of documentaries have interviews in them. Most of them do. And these are some of the things that I've learned to get what you want out of your interview. Uh, first thing is be prepared. It doesn't help a subject if you show up and you're nervous as well. Um, and being prepared really helps cut down on those nerves. So a pre-interview I've found is extremely valuable if you can get one with um, with the person you're interviewing. Uh, you know, maybe don't maybe don't ask them quite everything that you want to ask, but it, it at least helps you and them know what you're going to try to get out of the interview and helps you clear up any gaps they might you might have in their story and uh, brings them into the pre-production of the overall vision. If they're going to be one of the main people in your story, 
uh, having that collaborate, bringing them into that collaboration and letting them share in the vision can be really, really valuable and also helps you uh, not do something that's false or, or find out later, oh, this actually isn't what they wanted to do and now I have to adjust, which like I said, that happens all the time anyways, uh, adjusting and changing, but having this pre-interview uh, I think helps everyone be on the same page of what's gonna happen. And you might get some, some brand new stuff in the interview, hopefully you do get some fresh stuff, but pre-interview is great. And then with written questions, uh, even if you have your outline, I would say look at your questions and think about what is going to be going through their head as you're going through the questions. And even if you're going to start on, on a subject and go away to some other stuff and come back to it, it might make more sense for them to have all those questions in a row. Where is their head at? Where is, are you bringing them to their childhood? Are you bringing them to a specific moment? Uh, and try and link those things up together so that it's a fluid thought process for them. Uh, second thing is the setting, uh, just making sure that it's a comfortable place for both the interview and interviewer and interviewee. Um, and, and I would say, in my experience, audio is a lot more important than video in your interviews, especially if you're going to be using it underneath B-roll later on. You can use your interview as a way to, you know, creatively utilize that cinematic language. But uh, if you can't hear what they're saying very well, or, you know, there's noise or there's distractions, then that's definitely not the best setting. I'm going to uh, join in to is, agree with you as a <laughs> performer programmer. Um, that is something that we definitely look for um, in films because the bad sound just takes you out of it way more than maybe a shaky camera or, you know, a shot that's a little bit grainier than it should be. Um, yes. So just here to agree on that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Audio is very important. And I know I've talked mostly about visual stuff in this, but there's also really creative ways to bring audio in, whether it be music or sound effects and things like that, um, that you might not even think to put in a documentary, but are super valuable. And yeah, audio is a big, a big thing. It's half the thing, it's half of it. So don't forget that. <laughs> um, so third thing is be transparent. And again, that pre-interview really helps in this because Everyone knows what they're trying to get out of it. Uh, it I, I am not the type of filmmaker that wants to surprise someone in an interview or shock them or uh, you know, get something like that. I prefer the person to know exactly what we're both in there to get. And then even in the questions themselves, you can say, you know, this is what I'm getting at. This is what I want. This is kind of the, the story. This is where this is going into the edit. Like, there's really no need to be uh, to be quiet, to be hidden about where you're gonna go with with their story. I think it's always best to be super transparent, um, which goes into the fourth point, praise, which also helps with trust. Both of those things on the bottom, uh, I think trust is extremely valuable when you're making a documentary. You know, with narratives, uh, you can kind of, these characters aren't real in narratives. And so you can make them do things and say things and everyone knows that it's coming from your head. But if you're crafting a documentary, there's real people and real stories involved and they're real faces. And so they need to trust you as a filmmaker to be that vessel for their story. So praise, praise, praise. I don't think you can praise someone enough in an interview. Um, I mean, maybe you can, maybe if they were like, okay, I get it, I'm fine, you know, then maybe they don't even need the praise anyways. But most people uh, are pretty nervous in interviews and uh, are also just not sure that they're saying, they might answer the questions fine, but they're not sure if they're saying what you need. And so if they are, definitely tell them. And if they aren't, go back to the, the transparent thing and, and explain it. Um, but yeah, all of these things together, I think help the interview uh, go smoothly and helps them really open up to you and give you that emotion that you're looking for really in 
any interview, whether it be, you know, a more in-depth emotional story about that person, or if they're just uh, saying a certain piece you need to complete your overall thing, if you and can get that person to be comfortable with you and trust you, then even if they're saying the same answers, the audience is going to be able to tell that they're being genuine and that they really mean this and that these words weren't put in their mouth and you're not as a filmmaker making this up and, and putting it in a certain, in a certain way. Um, so that goes a long way. All right. Last thing, the edit. So the edit, I, um, I would say my two favorite aspects of filmmaking are uh, directing and editing. So I love editing uh, and especially in documentaries, it's a whole, whole phase. Um, I call the edit the script of the documentary. I met a lot of y'all heard, have heard that before because in narrative, you already have the script, you know exactly um, what people are supposed to say when and what they're supposed to do when you maybe don't know you know, what shots you're supposed to use at each time. So there's a little bit of creativity there. Um, I mean, there's a lot of creativity in, in narrative editing too. But in the documentary, you are crafting that script. Unless you had it predetermined, like I was talking about before, this is really when that, that final script comes together. When you decide what is being said after what and what scene is happening after what. So uh, it's, it's very, very important. And uh, there's a phrase I've heard that writing is rewriting, meaning, uh, you know, you're not going to write the, the perfect scene on your first go. You're going to write something, but then you have it to rewrite. So in editing, I've, I've also heard editing is editing, which is kind of sounds funny. But uh, if you think about it, editing is Ed editing is adjusting what is there to make it the final product. So, you know, documentaries really can take time, take more time than narrative edits because you have to try things, you have to adjust things, you have to say, oh, well, uh, this is how I had it in the outline. Let me do that first. And then, well, maybe some things didn't work out like I thought they would. So you edit your edit. <laughs> Uh, and you just keep doing that until you hit that uh, emotional point you're trying to make. Um, and, and again, th this is, not again, but this is um, taking time on your edit, on a documentary edit is really important. Uh, you can't always do that, you know, if you have deadlines and things, but I will say stepping away and coming back to it can be really helpful. Um, even if it's just for an hour or so, just completely getting your mind away from it so that you can come back to it and it feels at least a little bit fresher. And sometimes that's all it needs for you to say, okay, this is the final edit. Because you can just get in there and edit and edit and edit and keep going. Uh, and you know the film isn't getting better necessarily. So that's important there. And also, um, as I was saying before, Sometimes you can edit a portion of your documentary before you even outline a different section of it. And that can be really valuable because you know, you really know what you've got from your previous footage and you know what you still need. And so that's where documentaries can, again, take longer <laughs> than narratives in some sense. And um, they, uh, they can go from, you know, pre-production, production, edit back to pre-production for a reshoot or for a different scene or something that you now realize that you need um, because, again, you're writing the script here. So that's the edit. And also music and graphics are, can be really important and valuable in a documentary, um, especially if you're doing one on more of a, like, larger subject matter instead of just an individual. Graphics are super helpful. Um, even the way that you, like typography, the way that you decide to show those graphics, the colors you use, says something to the audience. Um, as I was saying before with the cinematic language, you know, if you use red for text versus green, it's going to make the audience subconsciously, maybe consciously, uh, 
feel a different way about that information. So every single decision, you know, the cinematic language is still there in the documentary, even if you're not as intentional as a narrative, um, it, the audience is still receiving that the same way. So whether or not you plan for that shot to be shaky, it's gonna feel a little unsettling for the audience to see it. So if that moment really needs to be more grounded and powerful, you might need to, to reshoot it or to have something else there and put that shaky footage somewhere else. Um, so that's sort of my overall thing was uh, bringing the, the narrative world into the documentary. And that's all I had for the presentation part. Cool. Um, we did get a couple questions okay. um, during, so I want to kind of bring those up. Oh, sure. um, one there. person wanted to know um, what the the shots that you did for the My Friend the Goose were. It's kind of blurry, and then he's not blurry. Uh, he wanted to know if that is a camera trick or if you did that in editing. Um, gotcha. Uh, yeah, that was that was in that was on set or in camera. So that was me holding the camera. I'm pretty sure I had a shoulder mount on that one and turning the lens to co go into focus. Yeah, but you can actually you can do that in the edit. Um, it's going to look a little different, and depending on where your distribution is for your film that could matter more or less you know if you're planning on blowing it up on a big screen uh you know that difference might be more noticeable uh versus if you're you know like these films were mostly for social media so sometimes we can get away with little post edits like that but uh yeah that was in camera okay cool and this this is my question okay um, <laughs> i feel sort of selfish asking my own questions but no, go for it. um i i'm curious how you decide what you're going to use for b-roll because like i mean especially if there are films that are set in like a, a city that everybody knows like a lot of times people kind of use the same landmarks to kind of establish that um and i Kind of, I mean, just personally, I think that's kind of boring. Yeah. Um, like, you know, if, if you're making a film about Birmingham, like most things have a footage of Railroad Park. Most things have footage of Kelly Ingram Park. Most things have footage of like, I don't, I mean, if it's about, you know, football or something, there's like a football stadium and like, and but it feels like everyone is kind of using the same shots over and over again. So can you talk a little bit about how to kind of say what you're trying to say but also do it in a new way that might be a tall order for like 10 minutes or however much time we have yeah left. <laughs> no um well I would say again it depends on your distribution of your film like and your audience like if your audience if you're making a film that is national and people don't really know Birmingham then maybe you do need those landmarks in there but if you're not and you're just making a film about someone in town and uh, you don't necessarily need to use those. Um, as far as establishing shots go, I tend to want it to be more about the person that's being interviewed or about the topic. So like uh, versus versus where it is. I, I don't really think that the location of a story matters as much. Um, I think that the story you're trying to tell matters more. So maybe, maybe you do want, um, may maybe because of logistics and all these things, like you have to film this scene in Railroad Park, but then maybe you, you try and, and think of a creative way, like, okay, I'm going to do a low angle shot, or I'm going to uh, do this certain thing uh, as part of that cinematic language for that moment in it, instead of it just being like a stable, like this is where we are. Um, it's like, well, what what point in the story is that? Is is it just? Um, yeah, I think yeah. Uh, I think that there's really creative ways to to even get establishing shots if you feel like you need them, especially if you're bouncing around. Like if so, most of my stories are just like one person um, that I've done in documentaries. Uh, I like to just like dive deep into an individual, but. Uh, a lot of other documentaries are about lots of different things. And so if you're trying to establish a different location, maybe it's more about the transition between the cities. Well, what is that shift you're trying to, to say? Is, are we going to a more expert person on the subject? Are we going into an emotional story or something like that? Uh, and then you can think about, well, maybe there's a transition that we can have there that goes from this wide overarching thing down to this like 
okay, now we're honing in on an individual story. So instead of getting a wide shot of Birmingham, we're going to go, we're going to go tight and we're going to get rack focus shots and we're going to get really small little details uh, to help set the stage for that part. Cool. I was also thinking about a, a film that I saw recently that had, it had, I mean, it was a documentary short and it had a lot of characters in it and they're, they had like, you know, little t lower third titles with the person's name, um, you know, when the person was first showing up, um, but then they didn't maintain it throughout and I found it hard to kind of keep track of, of who whose storyline was whose because mm -hmm. those graphics weren't included because there were so many people that they were interviewing. Um, yeah. So I think the point that you made about graphics being important is a good one because the film was about something that I was interested in and so you know I tried really hard to like maintain my focus but yeah just, I think I think in that um, th there can be a way to sort of like make a subject super prominent and and everyone's gonna remember who they are but then if there's like a group of people that are all very minimally in it um sometimes less is more and if it's not really important like what their job title is or something or, and it's just more important that they say the piece they're saying then maybe ha not having that you just be like okay this is just a person um talking about it but uh uh, a thing I didn't talk about was feedback and showing your film to other people, um, which is sort of like stepping away and coming back to it, having fresh eyes look at it, um, that someone else might, you you know who they are because you've been editing it this whole time, but someone else might uh, be like, actually, I can't follow, I don't remember who that is because you only showed it on screen uh, really fast. Also, I've heard showing something on screen, you should be able to read it three times. Um, in a row really fast. That's how long it should be on screen. That's a but good I didn't know that. When you think about uh, a phone and a large cinema, the time it takes to read something is different because on a phone, it's like this big and your eyes are just going like that. And on a screen, your eyes are going like that. So again, distribution matters too. If you're going to blow it up on a big screen, you might need to have your text on longer. Yeah. I was watching it on my laptop and usually I watch stuff on my TV, so maybe that was part of it, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But also, they probably just needed to have more graphics. <laughs> yeah, also, I think quarantine brain is a thing, so it's entirely possible that my brain was just like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. All right, well, I don't think I have any more questions. Do you have any final words of wisdom for everybody? Guys, uh, this is your last chance if you want to ask questions in the comments. <laughs> it's time to shine. Yeah, go go make movies. Don't be scared. Try new things. Everyone will learn. Be nice to everyone. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you're we were talking with. about that in Filmmaker Happy Hour yesterday. It's important to be nice to everybody. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think we have anybody else coming to ask questions, so thank you so much. Um, I don't have a speaker confirmed for next month. I'm kind of taking salons a month at a time because I think everyone is kind of taking everything a month at a time right now. Um, but we are on the calendar. I'm going to, I'm planning for things to be virtual uh, for the foreseeable future. So um, if you like this, maybe come back here. Uh, next the first Tuesday of next month whatever date that is I'm kind of blanking um <laughs> and yeah. I would be here talking about filmmaking topics with another uh filmmaker so Lauren thank you so much again and um hope yeah, everybody thank, thank you Kiwi Kiwi's awesome everyone be nice to Kiwi always yes be nice <laughs> to me or else I, that's it I have nothing to threaten you with i I'll just frown at you. That's the, that's yeah, it. You'll feel really bad. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, my dog right. will be mad at you. That's that's Aww. the real consequences. <laughs> oh wait, we have one more question. Two more questions. Okay. Um. Okay. So one is, do you have a quarantine project? Do I have a quarantine project? Um. Well, so I did. I have one that I already completed. That's kind of fun. Uh. I did a stop motion video for for my job. It was uh supposed to be this thank you letter to all the essential workers and because we couldn't and that was back in like April so we like really couldn't film anything so it was either going to be all archival or all like virtual and we decided to do a stop motion thing with 
like little objects to share the story of what was going on, like little shoes and little stamps and stuff like that. So uh, that was, that was fun. Um, that's probably the most like quarantine. Well, I did another music video closely after that for a contest where I also did some stop motion stuff. I had these little figurines and I put them in different little places around my house and made it look like, like it was, it was like I was a kid. They were like in this whole world. Like I put a little elephant in our corn, uh, corn planter outside. And it was like, oh, this elephant's in a giant forest now. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of, that was kind of fun being in my house, making that. Um, so yeah, there's definitely stuff y'all can do. Y'all can get real creative, even, even with all the limitations. That's actually a good question. Yeah. Film, film is, has, is still going on guys. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I actually had a high school teacher that gave me a piece of advice that I have carried with me since then, which I feel is pretty rare. Yeah. I think most people are like high school didn't happen, um, which is totally understandable. Uh, but he said to treat your limitations like your superpower and figure out how to work around them. Um, because I have ADHD, so sometimes I have a hard time focusing. I want to I don't always finish my thought. I can go from A to F and then other people are like, how did you get there? And I'm like, oh, but I did all of this. And they're like, what? <laughs> so, you know, I was really struggling with it at the time and I was feeling really frustrated because I was like, you know, why can't I just, why can't my brain do the thing that everyone else's brain is doing? Yeah. And, you know, it, it was very freeing to, to think about it that way. And, um, but yeah, I think that's true for film too. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think with like, with like that music video I was talking about, you know, our first thoughts were, oh, we're gonna get like, you know, me on like a bike and we're gonna be like outside and we're gonna like film this thing. And then I was like, we probably shouldn't like be all like outside doing this. <laughs> and so that forced us to have a totally different idea that I think was way better and due to the limitations. So yeah, that's a great, that's a great quote. Yeah, thanks for watching. He's probably not watching this, but hey. <laughs> Nice. Cool. Um, is there another one? Another well, Dan was asking if this is going to be available. I think that these are available to watch as a regular video once the stream ends, but if anyone wants to watch it or came in halfway through, I'm recording it, so you can just email me if you're having trouble accessing it, and I'll send it to you. Um, my email is kiwi at sidewalkfest.com, and it's just kiwi was spelled normally. I have to spell my name differently on Facebook, so um, yeah, K-I-W-I. But okay, I think that's really it. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks Keely. So this was fun. Yeah. I'm excited to see others. Thanks. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah. Bye, y'all.